Well, should we start just by saying hello? Because certainly Angeline and Lauren, we've not met before. So hello, I'm Andy. Um, lovely to meet you. Thank you. I'm Angeline. And I'm Hi, Angeline. Yeah. Hello. Nice Great. And, and have you all met each other? I mean, obviously, I'm sure you've met Helen, but you, you've met, yeah. 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 Right. Cool. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, uh, first off, maybe just so I find my bearings, how, how long do we have on this call? And do you have other things you'd like to cover? Or is it just working through the confirmation practices today? We put aside an hour for the call. Um, we we probably won't do more more on st more stuff on tactical um, today, as there aren't that many of us. So, so it feels like a really good opportunity to do a deep dive into confirmation practices. But if that only takes forty minutes, I know people have got lots of other things to do, etc. So, so um, over to you. Great. Okay. Brilliant. Um, well, look, I have... Anissa as well. Hi, Anissa. Hi, Helen. Hi. Hi, Anissa. Hi. I'm I'm Andy. Anissa. Nice to meet you. I couldn't, I couldn't hear you there, but you're on um, mute, Anisa. I'm unmuted now. Hello, everybody. Hi, Andy. Nice to meet you. And you, and you. Do you know everyone, Anisa? Well, I haven't got my glasses on, and I'm on my mobile, but I can see Helen's red hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know a few people, and I'm kind of new to the team, so I will get familiar as we go along. Okay, good stuff. Um, okay, so we were just getting started. So if I just do a bit of a, an overview of what I think we could cover. Um, so we're going to talk about confirmation practices. I thought I'll, I'll give you just a quick overview in terms of what are they and, and why are they? You know, what is the problem they're attempting to help us solve? Um, I thought I'd give you an example of them as well. So Ben has um, shared some stuff with me that I thought I'd take you through and I know he'll join us soon. Um, and then I thought I'd offer you a kind of coaching framework that you can use and you can use it in a couple of different contexts. So the coaching framework is just how can you use confirmation practices in a way that gets the most out of them. So if I take you through all of those and then when I've done that, I think um, I'll just ask you the question, what do you want to do next? So we could do a worked example together or you could go off and do your own thing or let, let's just see where we land. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to share my screen to start with. So let me just do that first. So hopefully you can see a picture of some sand dunes there. You got that? Okay, and if I just switch to this, so you've got a sketch note in front of you, I hope. Yeah, so this is, um, this is a sketch note that um, Saskia Dorman down in Poole did for me um, when we were doing some work around confirmation practices. And... Essentially, where, where the idea of confirmation practices came from was I've been doing lots of work around performance management and, and that sort of stuff for ages. And I guess what I noticed was um, traditional approaches to performance management tend to put people into quite defensive sort of ways of thinking. Um, so, you know, it, they often become about... Um, someone who has less power than someone further up the hierarchy having to prove to that person up the hierarchy that they've done their job well um, and the kind of language is all about accountability um, and um, and I guess the dynamics that I saw where people end up doing lots of things to justify their existence where they feel like maybe they've not quite fully delivered, there can be a tendency to attribute blame elsewhere rather than kind of owning the responsibility. And it, it feels quite defensive. So I know that's not wellbeing teams, but but if you think about life prior to wellbeing teams, does that resonate? I mean, do you recognize that as true of the world? I'm recognizing it not within wellbeing teams, but with a family I'm working with. Um, okay. So it's quite tricky. So I'd welcome any advice and support as we go along. So very much, yeah. Okay, cool. So, so the idea then behind confirmation practices is how do we manage our performance without creating all of that stuff? Yeah, how do we kind of go from defensive to um, feeling like actually we're kind of able to grow into ourselves and develop ourselves, uh, feeling like where things aren't working so well, uh, that's something we really want to talk about and, and discover a better way rather than feeling like we need to hide it. Um, so, 
so for me, the language is less about accountability, which I think sort of invokes our ego and our defense mechanisms, and more about responsibility and how we can support each other to, to develop and grow and become our best selves. Yeah. So that's, that's what the thing on screen is trying to communicate. Um, and in order to do that, I guess we need some frameworks. So, um, so here's one of the frameworks, which is uh, called the Skilled Helper Model. This comes from a guy called Gerard Egan. And what I like about this is it's just a way for people to support each other to have really good discovery type conversations. Yeah. So in stage one, and you can use this with the people you support or you can use this with each other as colleagues. In stage one, you're just doing lots of active listening. So, um, so essentially, you have a colleague there, you're saying, tell me a bit about what's happening, <laughs> what's going on in your world, um, uh, you know, what are you enjoying at the minute, is anything stressing you out, oh, tell me a bit more about that. Um, the really key thing in stage one, though, is when we're listening to people, we need to be careful to be um, not judging them, yeah? So whatever they tell us isn't something that we're going to sneer at, um, but also we need to be listening in order to understand, not listening in order to catch each other out. So I've seen this framework used badly before, and, and where it's used badly, it's when people think, I know what's wrong with Andy, right? I'm going to listen to him until I've got enough evidence to catch him out, and then I'm going to prove to him why he's a Muppet, <laughs> right? So... That is not stage one listening. That's um, that's going to take us the wrong route. So in stage one, what you focus on is just help me know what it's like to be you. Yeah, if I can crawl inside your head and think the things you think and feel the things you feel, what would it be like? That's stage one. And when we've done that, stage two is then about from that perspective of empathy and mutual understanding. It's helping someone to think about, okay, um, we know what it looks like from your point of view, but can we start to consider what this looks like from other perspectives? Yeah. So we might start, again, if you were working with a, a family, let's say, you might have been listening to um, mum and dad, and you might start saying, well, I wonder how this looks to your kids, or how does this look to granny and grandpa, or how does this look to the neighbour, or, um, you know, that sort of thing. Or with colleagues, it might be, um, I get how this looks like to you in your role. Um, what do you think Helen's worrying about? Or what do you think Kath's worrying about? Or those sorts of things. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so one of the ways of doing stage two is to encourage someone to think about it from different points of view. Another way of doing stage two is to use data and checklists and that sort of thing. So, so kind of encouraging people to challenge their own perspective by actually saying, okay, so you think X is going well. Um, what data can we look at that would help us confirm that that's the case or challenge that? Yeah. Um, and I'll come to an example of that in a minute. And in stage three, all we're doing is we're saying, okay, we've had a good chat. We've done some reflective practice together. We've kind of maybe uncovered some blind spots or some questions we want to go and ask. Now can we talk about what are we actually going to go and do? Yeah, And that might be we need to go and find out more and get more data. Or it might be we need to raise attention in a tactical meeting. Or it might be we've just got a really practical thing we need to go and get done. Yeah. So, so that's the three stages. Um, and they link into confirmation practices in a way that I'm just going to demo to you. So here is... Um, a worked up example of Ben's confirmation practices. Um, you don't have to use this format, but uh, I had a couple of hours spare and I thought, you know, I'd make a pretty picture. So, <laughs> um, so if I explain to you what we've got on screen. So around the outside of the wheel, you've got a handful of statements that Ben and I worked up together. Um, and they're color coded because they belong to different kind of domains of Ben's job. So in the top uh, middle and to the top right, you've got stuff that's to do with learning and development. And when Ben and I had a chat, we said, okay, what is it about your role, Ben, that um, you would want to be true if we were doing the learning and development bit perfectly? 
And through a bit of conversation, we said, well, the first thing that would be true would be that new colleagues are clear about what's expected in the role. Um, and clear in regards to their own learning and development and how they can support others in the team. Yeah? So we came up with that statement at the top to just capture that. And the way that we would use that in a confirmation practice is um, I might sit with Ben or Ben might sit in his own reflecting and he'd just look at that statement and we'd say, okay, if perfect is that that statement is completely true of all colleagues all of the time, then we would give ourselves a kind of score of five and on our little diagram here this dot at the outside would represent a five um, or if we're not quite there but we think we're really pretty bloody good we might put a little x on the dot here to represent a four or if we think that statement is completely false and we're nowhere close to it we might score ourselves a one and put a little dot here yeah so so this is just a way of just kind of plotting how do we think we're doing. It's deliberately subjective. The idea isn't to be right. The idea is just to kind of get our feelings on the table without worrying about whether we're right. So this links back to the three stages in that this is stage one. This is me sitting with Ben, listening to Ben saying, how do you feel we're doing? Oh, I think we're three out of five, Andy. Oh, that's really cool. Help me understand why you think we're three out of five. What is it that means we're not five out of five? What is it that means we're not one out of five? Um, what are you worrying about? What are you feeling confident about? That sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if we were to do that, um, let me see if I can uh, do this live with you. Uh, so um, I'm not going to ask Ben to do this for real, but what I could do is I could start to kind of, as I talk to Ben, I could start to plot his scores. So he might say, oh, I'm feeling like a, a four out of five on my first one. And Andy, I'm, I'm feeling like things aren't going so great on my second statement. Um, but I think we're doing really, really well on the what if card stuff. So I'm going to give that a five out of five. And you can see all I'm doing, you could do this with a pencil, but I'm just starting to kind of construct much like the, um, I think you call them uh, well-being circles, or what are you calling them, Helen? They, uh, well, we were calling them outcome circles, but we couldn't make the circles work on the paperwork, so we just... Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so it's a similar idea to what you're using with the people you support, though, but you can just, essentially, you can just start to kind of create a bit of a shape that gives you a visual of how are we doing and where might we put our energy, yeah? And if you find you're doing it on a screen and you don't fancy the technology of having to drag lines around and all that sort of stuff, if I got rid of them, um, it's really not a problem at all to just do something much simpler, which would be, um, let's just put an X on each bit, yeah? The thing I like about doing the lines is it makes it much easier to see where we need to put our focus, that's all. Um, so, so that's kind of stage one in a confirmation practice. It's we look at the key elements of a role. We have a conversation around how do you think we're doing. We don't worry about whether you're right or wrong. Uh, this is about making things that are hard to discuss easy to discuss. So it's deliberately not about saying what's the truth. It's just saying how does it feel? And it's exploring how you feel and why you feel to generate our little score, yeah? And, and it's really genuinely as simple as that. Once we've done that, we can move to stage two. And so stage two, if I flip to the screen to the next bit, in stage two, behind each of the statements that Ben created, um, that's the column down the left, we had a conversation together about, okay, if we wanted to challenge our perspective on how we're doing, what data would we get? What things could we go and observe that would help us challenge that perspective? And so Ben came up with, well, we've got a Trello board that we've created that helps us to see how are people doing and where are they in their learning and development. Um, uh, there's some data like just, you know, I, I can't know how people are doing if I don't know who the people are. So how many new people have we got started that I need to go and worry about? Um, 
And also we've got observations like, actually, maybe I could just go and spend time with some of um, the people in the organization and see how they're doing and ask them some questions. So data and observations we could use to challenge ourselves, but also a little checklist that we could use to challenge ourselves. So if I was coaching Ben and I was in stage two of that framework I described, I might be saying, okay, Ben, cool. So you said you think we're four out of five on this statement. And we've had a bit of a chat about why that is and how you feel about that. Let's just use our checklist to make sure that you really feel these things are covered. So, Ben, you know, do you know where we're recruiting new starters at the minute? So do we have visibility of that? Oh, actually, no, I don't, I don't know. Oh, maybe we need to find that out so that we can go and see whether those people are developing the way we want them to. Yeah. Or, um, uh, you know, do we know when refresher courses are required for, for people and how they're doing in terms of um, progress through those courses? If not, maybe we shouldn't say we're confident in their learning and development because we just don't know enough. Yeah. So again, let me pause for a second. Is this making sense? Yeah. It's okay. So, so if you're coaching each other, all I'm suggesting is stage one, give each other a really good listen to with this sort of thing in front of you. Come up with some scores, have a chat about how we feel and why we feel that way. Stage two, use the data, use the checklists to invite someone to challenge themselves, um, to explore where there might be blind spots or a need to go and get a bit more information. And then stage three just brings us back to this, which is now we've had a really good conversation and we've challenged ourselves a bit. Let's just capture the things that we need to do. So in the same way as before, I can just go into any one of the statements and I can say, okay, well actually what I really need to do is find out more about new starters. Yeah, and I'm just gonna capture that action there so that I don't lose sight of it. Yeah, um, now, Good stage three conversations tend to encourage people to be very particular around the action and when it's going to be taken and how we'll know that it's done. Yeah, so um, so you might not need to capture all of that, right? But but I think if you're coaching someone through this, I'd encourage you to be um, quite particular around the stage three facilitation where you're saying, okay, so we need to go and find out more about new starters. That's really cool. Uh, is that for all teams, Ben, or is that a particular team that you're worried about? Uh, okay, it's just Ashton. Okay, um, so in Ashton, when do you think you'd be able to do that? And and so you're you're helping the person you're coaching to be really concrete in their plans rather than leaving it too vague for them. So th this slide kind of talks about that detail. Um, and I'll go through each of the bullet points in a minute, but just since we're on the focusing action one, um, you're helping someone explore what are the different options for what they might do. You're helping them find their favored option as well. Um, so it's kind of trying to be sensitive to where is someone's energy to act rather than having one of those kind of fictitious conversations where you're very nice to each other and you talk about all the wonderful things that you could do and you know poor Ben sitting there thinking but there's no bloody way I'm ever going to do that <laughs> so so paying lots of attention to you know where's Ben's energy in this example what's realistic for him uh, helping him to kind of uncover his favored one Helping, helping them to describe what done looks like. So, okay, Ben, we need to go and find out about new starters. So let, let's just be really clear what this task is. So um, by the time this is done, you'll know exactly who the new people are that have joined the Ashton team in the last six weeks or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, so you're going to go and do this by when, and also just helping them think about, um, you know, do you need any help with that? So you're not necessarily volunteering the help yourself, but you're just trying to make sure that um, that Ben in this example has not just taken a burden on himself that's unrealistic and that he knows to ask for help. So again, if we put this in the context of your tactical meetings, I think this is a really good way to identify and raise tensions. 
So if I were coaching Ben and he was struggling with this one, I'd be saying, okay, Ben, well, let's take it to the Friday tactical meeting. Let's raise it there and let's seek support from others. Yeah. Okay, so again, let, let me pause because I've talked at you for a good few minutes there. Um, does it make sense? Does it feel helpful? Do you have any questions? Have I stunned you into silence? <laughs> <laughs> Andy, I wonder if, um, so we, if we could practice what we usually do on um, tactical meetings, which is do this as a round, um, and the person uh, like you who's facilitating it would um, identify who you want to go first, second, third, and fourth. Um, so I'd, I don't, would that, would that be okay? If that sounds great. That sounds great. Practice. So... I think just to try and be fair, since I've picked on Ben with the example, maybe, maybe I'll ask Ben to go first. Uh, so Ben, any, any thoughts, reflections, whatever you want to share there? Yeah, I, I um, found the process of um, putting it together, well, well, you put it together basically <laughs> after our conversations. So just having you know that mapped out, so the conversations that we had were really useful to kind of think about all the elements of the role, but then having it mapped out in the way that you presented it was really, really helpful for me. And it's helped me find it, I find it much more easier to sort of conceptualize the role and think about where things fit. Um, and, and also, so once, you know, I haven't started having those conversations um, about where things are at, but I've already used it to think, self-reflect um, where things are at. Uh, so that's been really, really helpful. I wonder, is there a um, template, Andy, that you've got a set of templates, like blank templates that we can that we can use, that other people can use as well? Yes, yeah, so the, that layout. for that layout, what I thought I'd do following this call is I'll send you through a kind of pack of the templates that I've done for yourself and for Kath and others. And, and what anyone can then do really is is just change the, the kind of text that's in there for the statements that make most sense in your role. Um, equally for anyone that I've not done this with so far um, you know if you want to pick the phone up to me and we just have a call for half an hour and I'll help you develop them dead happy to do that as well great the, the other thing I thought was that some of the statements will probably um, change slightly and be amended and tweaked and, and as we learn more and as sort of the role develops and, and I learn more so um, I think that's just important to, to remember really that some of those statements will tweak and kind of, of uh, adapt with the role really yeah yeah I think that's a really good point and um, I, I mean it's probably common sense for everyone but I think it's worth with all these things coming back to their purpose so their purpose here is to help you to um, really sort of set your priorities and find your opportunities to improve in your role and grow in your role so exactly as you've said, Ben, you, you might get to a point where some statements become redundant, not necessarily because they're not part of your job anymore, but because, you know, they're so routine and you, you've kind of systematised them and you're on the ball that what we need to do is put our energy elsewhere. Um, and, and similarly, I think um, the checklists and the data that we have behind the statements, I expect as you use them, you'll refine them quite a bit from what we started with. Yeah, I was just thinking about the new start as example. So once we get the Trello board tied down and we've got that working really well, you know, I think that'll be where the information is about new starters. So you know, in terms of knowing who's who is a new starter, then that'll be where I'll go. And and, and if that's working, then that statement will kind of, like you say, become redundant, really. So yeah, I thought that was like a good example. Cool, cool. Just just to jump back to something you said a minute ago as well that you talked about. Um, you know, you've been using the statements to reflect yourself. Um, and so the, where I've used these, there's been sort of three different contexts in which I found them useful. So one is what you've said. So once you've got these statements, you know, you don't need a meeting, you don't need coaching to be using them. You can just find five minutes over a coffee to just sort of pause your day and say, am I worrying about the right things? Am I focusing in the right areas? Um, Another one is when you have a colleague with you, whether they're a coach or just a colleague, you can just ask them to help you reflect. And I think that can be really useful. And a third one is when you're actually working together as a group that sometimes, um, you know, turning up with, um, you know, this diagram completed 
and just kind of putting it on the table with your colleagues and saying, I'd like you to help me kind of think about this, you know, um, because everybody's seeing your role from their different perspectives. So it'd be really interesting, given the role you've got, Ben, supporting wellbeing leaders and others, for them to be able to comment on some of these statements with you. Um, so, so I think, you know, personal reflective practice supported by a colleague or supported by multiple colleagues in a team all feel like valid ways to use this. Yeah, great. Thank cool. you. Okay, so since um, you're the next on my um, uh, cluster of, uh, of images, Anissa, we, we, any thoughts, comments, questions? Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, it's really timely, the stuff that you've pointed out, because like I say, I'm kind of in a bit of a tricky phase with the family I'm working with, um, and there were some tensions there, and communication wasn't working out quite well. Um, so I was felt in a very uncertain, unsafe place. And um, this week we've had a bit of a breakthrough, um, and we've been looking at, since our conversation on Tuesday, Ben, <laughs> Um, and so there's been a lot of listening going on on both sides um, with the family. We had a bit, a bit of a chat yesterday um, and there was, there was a lot of listening taking place on both sides. Um, so we've come to more of an understanding as to how we are in terms of where we're at. Um, what's been before and how we maybe see the next steps going and so much around building trust, you know, for the family inviting me into their home into their wills trying to work with them you know and well-being teams you know to back that up so um yeah lots of listening and um then we kind of definitely looked at reframe a little touching on stuff around reframing those three kind of stages definitely feel like some of that's been happening this week which mm -hmm. is really really reassuring um and and quite exciting as well so i know that myself and ben are going to be talking um after this session later today and next week with the family to look at and um, i think some of those conversations and reflections are really going to help us to to refocus action and next steps so that's been really helpful cool great great and i, I mean you know, tools are only tools. Um, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here saying, you know, this this will be a cure for all ills. But I, I guess, you know, where, where I've used this with people, um, having something uh, kind of visible and shared so that these conversations translate into something that, that you kind of hold in front of you can be quite helpful. Um, sometimes holding it all in our heads leads to misunderstanding. So I think, you know, if you're using those three stages of um, conversation, one of the, the tricks I find is is to just kind of use something like the, the image that's in front of you to say, okay, so can we? Can I just clarify? I think what you're saying matters to you is this. Is that right? Okay, well, let's capture that. And then when we come together next week, we'll just review how we did against that. Yeah, yeah I think I'll definitely um, use this to structure you know more of those conversations um and again just in terms of where i'm at with the role because it's very new and it's very um you know there's no templates if you like there's no before so mm. um yeah it'd be really useful as a guide i think okay happy days good yeah. all right um uh, who we have next how about uh, helen okay helen's waving go on helen i wanted to go next because i was really inspired by um something anisa said then and one of um the challenges and opportunities for us with working with families is having as you said a shared understanding of success and if the family have a really different understanding of anisa's role to our understanding i, I know that this is where challenges emerge so anisa and ben i, I wonder if if we have a version of this where Anissa and Ben can look at this with the family um, every week to say, you know, uh, that, that has around it the things that matter to the family and the things that matter to us. Because then we have been talking about getting shared ground or sort of shared agreements between wellbeing teams and the family. But if we could get something that looks like this, that, that Denise can say, well, actually, I think you're only a two this week, wellbeing teams and the family. And we can say, well, we thought it was more of four and, and we think it's four because of this. I mean, that's the way I presented it, like 
sounds a bit more conflictual than I mean it to be, but, but actually what we need is a shared understanding of what success looks like and a shared understanding of how we think we're doing. Um, and what we've used in the past in HSA is working, not working from different perspectives. And I think this gives us a different way um, of doing that. Um, so although um, Angeline and Lauren might be looking at this thinking, the confirmation practices that we've got as well-being leaders don't look like anything like this because they're, they're in tables. So, so Lauren and Angeline, with, with, and this not situation of the format of it, I think that with families, we might want to move away from the standard well-being leaders one and co-create something that works, uh, works with the families. So, so just what Ben said and what Anissa said made me go, oh, gosh, that could, that could absolutely be transform, transformational because it is all about trust, as you say, Anissa. But trust is also about having shared expectations um, that are realistic on both sides. And I know that's been part of our struggle with this particular family. Cool. I'd really welcome that. That'd be brilliant. And, you know, that's what's being fed back from the family at the moment. You know, there is confusion for them. There is a lack of clarity in terms of my role and going forward. And, you know, we've, we're just on the basics at the moment, getting to know each other and getting to know the boys. So that would be, I think Denise would really welcome that. I think it would really give us much more clarity going forward. Cool. Cool. Um, so, uh, Helen, you touched on there the um, formatting of what we've got on the screen here versus what um, we've used today. And again, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing the confirmation practices in tables. I, I think it's what's practical and, and what's your preference. Um, in case it helps, though, one of the reasons I put this together was um, I, I have started to spot a little bit of a pattern that where we make it visual, um people sort of engage and take more pride in it for some reason <laughs> so um so the, there's a little bit of um bureaucracy involved in terms of printing something this out like this out to use it but but it does seem to sort of help with engagement and the other thing that you can do is um it's a little bit easier to track changes over time so if you imagine your sort of spider diagram on here from week one when you review it week two and you plot over the top of it you can start to see our things shifting if that makes sense yeah um maybe just since you touched on it i didn't really go into this in detail so let me just do this and then i'll come to the rest of you for your thoughts and comments too um so I, I think this framework works in lots of contexts, be it helping families, be it supporting colleagues, be it just actually just living life. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there are some really easy traps to fall into with it. So the, so the bullet points here, I just sort of quickly skip through them. So in, in the listening phase, I talked about, you know, being really careful that you're not trying to catch people out, that you're not offering judgment. Um, also just trying to be really careful not to imply judgment through the questions you ask. Um, and sometimes, I know you've all got a background in compassionate communication, so using the compassionate communication insights you've got here can be really useful. So getting people to talk about, you know, what are the facts, what are the things that you can point to or see or cite in what's happened, um, and again, you're not judging those facts and you're not saying, oh, I think you got that wrong. You're just asking them, you know, so what's the story? And, and then asking them how they feel about it. And this is, I think, really quite important. So one of the things I've noticed is very often people will um, very quickly skip past something that they feel uncertain or uncomfortable about. So they'll mention it but they'll almost mention it mid-sentence so that they've moved on before you have a chance to focus on it. So if you're coaching someone or you're listening to the, the families and people you support, I think paying really close attention to this bullet point here, noticing and exploring emotions. So just watch for where are people skipping past something? Where do you see in someone's body language or you know the way they look at you? a moment of uncertainty and discomfort um, and I think just being conscious of that so you can return to it and what I've found personally is um, when I remember to do that very often they're the best conversations that I end up having with people because of the things that people kind of don't want you to lift the rock on until you do 
and then actually it's quite a release and an unburdening for them to know that there's a listening ear that's prepared to kind of hear that and not judge them about it. So, so I think that noticing and exploring emotions one is really important. Um, and also as you do that, doing the clarifying and focusing in bit. So just, you know, they, they start talking to you and it's just saying things like, oh, right, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Could you tell me a bit more about that, you know? Um, and it links to this last one, summarizing and playing back. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think I understand that. So can I just tell you what I think I've understood and you can tell me whether I got it right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, again, all techniques that I'm really confident you use all the time. For me, the benefit of this framework is they just remind you to use them. Um, so that's in the listening phase. In the reframing phase, again, little techniques. Um, you know, put yourself in other people's shoes. I talked about that. But also remembering to return to the facts and feelings one. So, so two questions there you might ask. One is, how do you think this looks to another person? You know, what different things do you think they see? But also, how do you think that person feels about this? You know, um, and, and one that I'd never thought to do before, but a colleague shared with me was to ask someone um, the question, if you were looking at yourself from the outside, how do you think you would describe the situation you're in? Yeah, now that, that might feel a bit obtuse, but what I found is when I've asked that one, people actually start to describe completely different things about their circumstances in their life, and they quite often start to talk about, well, actually, you know what? I, I'm really stressed about ABC, but I just need to give up on that. I'm just winding myself up there. And they, they've almost given you the, the point of leverage to then say, okay, well, what would help you stop worrying about that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then I've talked about the rest. So, okay. So again, I'll go back into shutting up and listening mode, back to stage one for me. So, um, Lauren, do you want to share any thoughts or reflections? I think it's just a very, really good visual tool to use and for us at this stage, because we aren't actually really implementing it at this moment in time, just something to refer to to make sure that we are doing everything correctly and mm. we've got something to look back to sort of navigate our way through using that tool. So, cool. And anything about it that, um, that you're sort of nervous about or unsure about or... All of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do some clarifying and focusing in at this point. So, I mean, any, anything specific or, I mean, I appreciate it's all new, but is there anything that you're sort of thinking, oh, I, I'm not sure I'd be able to go and do that without no, support, think, for example? I think it's quite, um, yeah, it's quite self-explanatory, like doing the scoring, looking at the subject, seeing how you're going to action a change or, you know, noting that what you're going to do. So I understand how it's going to be used, but um, until you're using it, I don't think I'm going to be, comp you know, it's just a confidence thing, really. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, I mean, like I said earlier, feel free to, you know, pick up the phone or drop me an email or anything if I can help, but also, you know, um, You've got a bunch of colleagues there that are, are going to be using this as well, so I'm sure you can support each other. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, Angeline, any thoughts? Um, yeah, if you could do this with us, that would be absolutely amazing, especially at the, at the start of our, our new journey. Yep. And it's being mindful, not what you say, but how you say it. Um, and it's just learning new tactical skills with speaking and, and dealing with people so mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a really good and useful tool for us. Cool. Andy, can I, do you mind if I interrupt uh, for a minute Please. and make a suggestion? So Angelina and Lauren and Anissa, we have version, Anissa, we have version one of the wellbeing leaders confirmation practice um, ultimately it'll be Mary who'll be supporting all of the well-being leaders in, in their role as well as people coming together here so Andy I, I wondered whether um, you could have a, a conversation with Mary and perhaps Angeline um, and Lauren together to yeah. take what we've already got into this kind of, of process so, um, so then we're co-producing it with Angeline and, and Lauren we're starting with our, our freshest thinking 
um, for wellbeing leaders anyway, but also involving Mary, who ultimately will be, be supporting people to make it happen. So that, that's perfect from my point of view. So I, in terms of making that happen, I think given that there's three of you and one of me, if, if you want to maybe get two or three dates that you think would suit you and I'm sure amongst those two or three I'll be able to fit into one of them. Fantastic. Would that work? Angeline would you mind coordinating that with with Lauren and, and Mary? I know Mary's got a particularly busy week next week but if you um, send her a message on Slack um, that would be really great. Great thank you that's fantastic. Great great okay and last by no means least then uh, any thoughts there Kath? Yeah I love the graphic um, yeah, I, yeah, I really like the graphic, the, the visual of it, just to plot things. Um, but yeah, the whole confirmation practices, I, I really like it. But my, I know we've chatted, but my learning moment was uh, quite unexpected. That, yeah, that word, I am confident, um, just made me feel hugely anxious. Um, yeah, and I, I was really not expecting that at all. Um, yeah, and I thought, you know, we're aiming for five and we're, you know, the best version of ourselves and we're aiming for that perfection. Um, yeah, and it just made me feel really anxious that I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm never going to get there. <laughs> mm. Um, mm. But I do, I do really like, the, yeah, so I think that I'm going to be much better um, doing it, reflecting with others about my role rather than doing that self-reflection thing. Because I think if I self-reflect, I'm a bit glass half empty. Mm -hmm. um so yeah so but doing it yeah with uh support and i'm thinking in my role and sharon who i work with in community circles and that peer support that we have to do that together uh it'll, it'll be great but yeah so i'm looking forward to doing it but yeah i'm conscious of that yeah that phrase yeah. Still well, makes me feel anxious yeah. i mean like, like we discussed when you raised it i found that really interesting because it's mm. it's almost the antithesis of what i wanted this to do because oh, yeah. i um so so you shouldn't feel guilty about that but i think that's mm. something we can keep under review in yeah. terms of the phrasing but also in terms of how you support each other i think it comes back to my first um my first slide if i jump back to it which is all of this is about trying to kind of create an environment where you know we've got psychological security we're not feeling like we're being hauled over the coals for our performance yeah. um so so i think it's really important um using those three stages to be listening attentively and generously to each other to support each other with those uncertainties um and um and in a sense you know it's not about ever being perfect you know the scores on that graph are sort of irrelevant they're just a way to help us get our gut feel out so that we can share what we're worried about yeah, um, yeah i really like how you know things that you know you're doing really well just become natural and you focus your energies on other ways and i'm really keen on that you know um that growth mindset yeah and i do feel that we have that environment of psychological safety and there's no blame um, mm. and I know where to reach for support if I'm struggling for some, with something. Um, so yeah, I wasn't expecting you know, mm. that statement to make me feel anxious, but it did. And I'm, So I'm just, yeah, I just wanted to share that yeah. uh, in case anybody else feels the same. Yeah, mm -hmm. good, good. Okay, well, the, one last thought before I ask you all what you want to do next, but um, the, the other thing I've noticed using this, particularly with, um, yourselves actually but it, uh, I've kind of tripped over it in part elsewhere is as we kind of worked up the statements as we worked up the checklist and so on it really became obvious that there are um, there are little ways of visualizing um, what's happening that I think can support this so I remember one of the early conversations Helen and I had about the wellbeing teams themselves and we landed on the idea of having the living well at home board as a way of just making it really visual how are the people we're looking after doing and and sort of the same thing came out when I was talking to Ben and when I was talking to yourself Kath we came up with ways of trying to visualize kind of what's happening so I, th I thought I'd just share an example of that so that you kind of have something you can be thinking on for yourself so if I jump to hear Emily and Ben put this together um, but when we were talking about for Ben's confirmation practices we were talking about 
a lot of the things he's reflecting on are um, to do with how are individual colleagues progressing through their learning and development, um, particularly new recruits and so on. And so they put together this Trello board where you've just got different stages that people are at in terms of recruiting them in, starting them, started and kind of moving forward. And what they did under these colleagues, I hope it's okay to click on these, is it Ben? It's not, they're not private? Oh, you, I can't hear you, sorry. No, I was just going to say, just, I'm just a little wary, just as I managed to end up with three Trello accounts, like I was trying to explain, and uh, I, I'm not sure whether this is the board, I think this is the live board for Ashton. Yeah. Uh, and I, and there's, there's a board that we've been working on for Thurrock, um, which is kind of a practice board, but this okay. is that one. So this is actually the live board for Ashton. Okay. And would it be sensitive if I were to click into one of them just to show people what's in there? Or is that no, okay? No, I think that's fine. Yeah. So, so really, I just wanted to share this as an illustration of behind your confirmation practices, having simple visual ways that are going to help you kind of reflect on how you're doing as well. So for Ben... You know, how are people progressing through their learning and development? Well, here's Caroline, for example. Um, we know what stage she's at because she's in waiting to start. And we've got little checklists of things we would want to be true if we're on track. So at, at a glance, Ben is able to kind of see where are my colleagues are at? How are they doing against the things that we need in place? And this is a shared record between Ben and Emily so that they can kind of track colleagues' development together. Like Kathy, so Sorry, so go on. I was just going to add, so for, for the um, new starters in Thurrock, what we will have for each um, person on their ticket will be things like the e-learning courses and um, progress that people have made through that, the med medication observation checklist being complete, all of those kind of things. So we'll have a visual for each person to check progress and make sure that everybody's uh, at the stage they need to be at um, and that we're confident that they've completed everything that we want them to do before um, they're ready to start work so that will be the so that the Thurrock um, team will be the opportunity to do that uh, Ange and Lauren and um, really? to have this tre Trello board working really really effectively for them yeah brilliant so again you know it's only an example but I think what struck me when I was talking to um to your colleagues in building up the confirmation practices was pretty much for every one of them there was something a bit like this which was a support to the confirmation practices it was it was just a simple tool to help them kind of keep track of how are we doing against the things that matter so Angeline and Lauren I think when when we talk it, it might be worth just kind of thinking um, what what are the bits of data or what are the tools that we can use behind the scenes that, that help you stay on track not to introduce more bureaucracy, but actually to eliminate the need for it. So, so for me, the sign of a really effective confirmation practice is that in five minutes or less, I could kind of sit with, um, sit with this diagram with Ben. We could have that Trello board in front of us and we could do a really accurate reflective practice because we have kind of everything in place and routine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So that was sort of everything I have to share. In terms of how you want to use the remaining time, I'm happy to do anything that feels helpful, uh, including just going away and leaving you to it, if that feels helpful. <laughs> Can I ask a question, um, Andy? It's about how we put this in, into practice. So we have um, a regular meeting um, Fridays at two o'clock. And one week it's going to be all of the well-being leaders plus the national team. Yeah. Um, and then the next week it'll just be the national team and the well-being leaders um, will have their own uh, tactical meeting so that we get to be together as a whole group twice a month. We wanted to build in our confirmation practices as part of that. So, so what do you reckon? So if, for example, we did our check-in and our moment of mindfulness, would you suggest that we then went into pairs and had 10 minutes looking at confirmation practices and then came out of that and did our metrics and, and tactical or are there other ways um, of doing this? So that's my first question. And then my second question is, is it better to do it with different people at different times? So for example, would Kath and Ben do it one week and then Kath and Angeline do it another week? Or is it better to have the same people um, reflecting with you week on week? 
Okay, so on on the first question, I, I, there are quite a few options, I think, and I, I, I'm keen to um, suggest that actually maybe you experiment a little bit to just work out what's going to work best for you. So kind of options that had occurred to me, um, first one, I think doing a, a kind of private, personal, reflective practice before coming on that call or as the first few minutes of that call. Um, so that's kind of not in pairs or anything. It's just doing it yourself. Um, and if you did that, one thing you could do is then share to the meeting your kind of spider diagram and say, here it is. This is what I'd like to talk about. These are the tensions I'd like to raise. So that's one thing you could experiment with. Um, another one is you could do that private reflection um, prior to your call. And then in the first few minutes of your meeting, you get into pairs to do a bit of peer to peer coaching. Um, another one you could do is sort of either of the above but but perhaps each week or once a month you say what we're going to do is we're going to do a deep dive into this particular individual um, where it's not about putting them on the hot spot but it's about saying let, let's give this person you know particular support and that's just rotated so I know for example um, Zoe Nicholson and the, the HERE team do a version of that where they invite one of the uh, enabling teams, they call it, to come to each of their, their meetings and to share a kind of key thing that they're worried about and then they spend the whole meeting focused on that. Um, so you, you could do sort of any of those things, I think, Helen, but I think what I'd suggest you start with is if people were to do a private reflective practice before the call, and then spend the first few minutes of the call in pairs discussing um, and see where that leads you. Yeah. Does that, does that sound reasonable? That, that sounds really, really good, good to me. So next week we'll just be the national team, but then the week after that we'll all be together again. So everybody, shall we assume that that's what we'll be doing with whatever stage our draft confirmation practices are? We'll have done some personal reflection first of all, and then we'll get into pairs um, in the call. And I've, Andy, what's brilliant about that is, is we've then got an immediate opportunity to raise and address tensions that emerge yeah. from our confirmation practices. So uh, Absolutely. that's really good. Thank you. Absolutely. And then that, that links to your second question, really, of, you know, do you rotate the pairs? Um, so my feeling is it's a good thing to do. Um, but I think this is a bit like having... Um, you know, different roles in self-managing teams, where if you rotate them too frequently, you might just kind of create a bit of chaos. So I think what I'd suggest is um, kind of commit to being kind of fixed pairs for a period of time and then rotate. So, um, I, and I'm only kind of stating the obvious here, I think, but the reason to rotate is to, to prevent groupthink kind of creeping in. Um, and the reason to not rotate too frequently is I think there's something about building trust and understanding of each other's roles and that sort of thing as well. Does that work for you? Thank you. That, that's absolutely excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, so that's it for me. So <laughs> Andy, just before you go, could I, um, I wonder if you might spend some time with Anissa and I, uh, mm -hmm. If you've got if you've got some time just to think about Anissa's confirmation practice as well. I don't know whether Anissa, I'm talking for you here, but I just wondered whether that would be useful for the two of us. Yeah, you read my mind. That's what I was um, going to suggest as well. I think that'd be really useful for me because I've not had the opportunity and the space to look at confirmation practice at all, and it's it's um, like I said, come at a really good time. So that would be really helpful. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Well, do you want to do um, similarly to uh, Lauren and Angeline then, if you just pick a couple of dates that, you know, work for you and I'll fit to one of them? Yeah, fab. Yeah, that'd be great. We could sort that later, Anissa, couldn't we? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Great. Okay, and, and what I'll do just in the meantime is I'll, I'll um, on Slack, I'll just post in the templates for all of these things so that you can kind of have a mess around with them. Um, and if they kind of get in a muddle, don't worry, just tell me and I can sort of help out where, where that's useful. Yeah. That's fantastic, Andy. Thank you so much. And look, timing wise, that's brilliant. We've got three minutes um, to, to go. So uh, that's been so, so helpful. Um, I've got the recording as well. So when that's become a recording, I'll post it into Slack so other people can have that too. But uh, really, really appreciate that, Andy. Thank you. Super. All right. We'll